Okay, so this is lecture seven, um, Lewis structures. And we'll go to the PowerPoint. There it is. So Lewis structures are how we show in a molecule and also ionic compounds, but not so much. What's connected to what? And we show the electrons. So we're showing where all the electrons are. If they are just as dots, that's called an unshared pair. It's a pair of electrons that's not being shared in a bond. This is a bond. So we put them as dots. It does not show the shape. The shape is shown by what we call Vesper, valence shell electron pair repulsion. This gives you the shape. But the Lewis structure, you start with the Lewis structure to get to the shape. So this lecture, we're going to talk, going to talk about how you get to the Lewis structure. All right. So remember with chemical bonding, you have, it's always involves the valence electrons. And when we draw Lewis structures, we are only concerned with the valence electrons. All right, not the inner electrons. The goal of any atom in a compound or molecule, regardless of the type of sharing, is to reach that lowest energy the lowest gas configuration, the, sorry, the lowest energy configuration, the noble gas configuration, where all of the electrons are paired in an ionic bond. That means that the electrons are all, are already either are paired within the individual atom and the connection is electrostatic and covalent. It's, a trip, it's achieved by sharing electrons. So each shared electron counts as a full electron for that atom. All right, I'm going to touch on electronegativity, but actually we're going to go into this more when we talk about polarity. Okay. But I've touched on a little bit. Electronegativity is the measure of a tendency of an atom to, to take the electrons to itself. So the more an atom wants electrons within a molecule, or even by itself, in the case of, you know, these guys which create hat, exist as minus one or minus two, exist as anions, because they are more electronegative, they can take the electrons. They have a higher affinity for the electrons. So that's called electronegativity. It increases as you go to the right and it increases as you go up. So the smaller your atom is and the higher the charge, the greater the electronegativity. So remember that fluorine is the most electronegative atom and it goes outward from there. So I'm going to come back to this, but be aware of this is to identify. So as you go left to right, you're going to increase electronegativity. So oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. Therefore, it's going to have more of the electrons around it. So I'm going to touch on that later when I talk about polarity. But be aware of this. Um, you will be using it in a lot of different aspects. Except particularly when we go to polarity. All right, so Lewis symbols are also called dot structures. And just as we, so let's go to the whiteboard. Oh, sorry. That's what happens when I have a weekend, a whole day off. All right. So you learned about the orbit and our models for, you know, drawing. So that's the nucleus and here's our first orbit. What, what are we going to draw here? Let's draw 
um, magnesium. Why not? So this is the 1S. Sorry. That's Chem 1 stuff. This is the first period, first shell. And that's the second shell. And we're going to do magnesium, the element, not the ion. So magnesium is in period three. So it's going to have a third. Pretend these are beautiful and round and perfect. So my inner shell has eight because it's inner. And then the next one, magnesium, it has two valence electrons. So all we're concerned about in Lewis structure or dot structures are the valence electrons. And the way we would draw them is you would write the symbol for the individual element and you would put, just as you put the valence electrons in your orbit, you put them around the symbol. And in the same way, one and one, you do not pair them. You are illustrating with the symbol what's happening with the orbits. So that's what magnesium looks like. Carbon, right? If we go to carbon, um, look at your periodic table. It would be very helpful if you have periodic tables on hand for these lectures. Uh, you can see it a little better. So here's carbon. So it has one, two, three, four, and it's in group four, four A. So you, you could just know it has, it's in group four A, therefore it has four valence electrons, right? So if you were drawing that orbit, you would have the four, but for dot, the Lewis structure, we do that. This also represents the bonding pattern. Carbon generally has four bonds. It's going to share each of these electrons with an electron from another element and create a bond. That's your covalent bond for carbon. So every element has its own Lewis symbol, dot structure like that. And then we combine these to give the structure of a molecule. A little bit different from an ion because in an ionic bond, the electrons have already been distributed. So I'll touch on that. You will have to know that. And it's, it's easy to forget. So make a note somewhere when we go, get to the ionic depiction, um, how it's done, because we won't do very much of it. But it's likely to be on a test. All right. So let's go back to the periodics, uh, the slideshow, the PowerPoint. OK. So here are some Lewis symbols, right? There's carbon. So look at the periodic table. However many valence electrons, and it coordinates with the group number, right? Look at the group number. That's your column. That will tell you how many valence electrons. And you put it around the symbol, one dot at a time. And then if you have nitrogen has five, now we go back around and we start pairing them. Okay, oxygen has six, so it's one, two, three, four around, and now you go back and start pairing. And so you have two pairs and two unpaired. Fluorine has seven. There's your one unpaired. And neon, helium, argon, these are your noble gases. They have all paired electrons. You see that? So they're, they're not reactive. There's no reason for them just to spontaneously give up or absorb another electron because everything's paired. So the valence electrons, the outer orbit electrons are around the element symbol and that's how we draw the dot structure. And it won't let me go down for some reason. Okay, this is another depiction and the important part of this slide, and it actually is very important, is the way these are placed around often show their bonding patterns. It shows their most common bonding patterns. 
fluorine has, let me get enlarge this. Fluorine has one unpaired electron, right? Fluorine is going to, fluorine is going to form a bond, a single bond right there. Nitrogen commonly, the key word here is commonly. Now fluorine always only forms one bond. It's too small to do anything else. Nitrogen commonly forms three bonds. So when you have to put nitrogen in a molecule, most of the time you're going to put it in there with three bonds. That's the most common form. Carbon has four unshared, un, unshared or unpaired electrons, not unshared, unpaired electrons, and it generally makes four bonds. <sighs> My door's opening again. Oxygen generally makes two bonds. So this dot pattern also is very convenient to remember that it it shows the most common bonding. So when you're putting these together into molecules, this is a good starting point. All right. So if you're given a dot structure, you should be able to identify the element immediately. So this element has two, four, five, six electrons. And so if we go back to the bonding pattern, here's, here's the six right here. So that's oxygen. Now it's not just oxygen, it's everything in group six. Remember group six A, I use the old number system. And so this is oxygen and there it commonly makes two bonds. This is anything in group one. However, the only thing we have from group one in our answers here is sodium. So number two is sodium. And number three has one unpaired electron. This is group seven, right? You count, you have seven electrons, seven valence electrons. It's any of the halogens. And in this case, it would be chlorine. If carbon were up here, you would have four dots. One, two, three, four around it. Nitrogen has five. It has one pair and then three singles. So you should be able to look at any dot structure and identify the element. Okay, ions. Ions make ionic bonds. They already exist as with the electron distribution. They're always trying to get to for an element to become an ion is trying to get to that perfect state of a full shell, which means because we're drawing the valence electrons, a cation, so magnesium, loses. And this is showing that it's giving up the electrons to oxygen. And yes, it can happen that way, or it can already be out there as the ion. So this little cartoon, it's not showing a sharing, it's showing here, take my electrons. So the valence electrons of magnesium ion are zero. So you have to draw the Lewis structure for magnesium within brackets with nothing around it because the valence shell that we care about for magnesium is the period that it's in. Oxygen gets a full shell by adding, and so we show that it, the oxygen ion, the oxide ion, has eight electrons around it. So you put ions in brackets, you put the charge over the bracket, and you put the valence electrons around it. If you have a cation, there's nothing there. If you have an anion, it's full because that's the point of something becoming an ion. If you have a, an ion with more, you know, with this has three ions, one of them is going to go in the center. Well, magnesium is, has a two plus. So it has to be the center ion because it's going to, there are two chlorines, so they have to be on either side of the magnesium, all right? You're not going to put a chlorine next to a chlorine. They both have negative one charge. Those electrons are going to, you have repulsion. 
you put them in such a way that they balance. You put the positives next to the negatives. So your magnesium as an ion has nothing in its valence shell. So we draw it with nothing there because the shell is still there. There's just nothing in it. They left. Chlorine has completely filled shells. So you look at the period that it's on. You put them in brackets next to each other with the charge outside of the bracket. So this is how you draw ions. And it said, make a note of it because we don't do much of it and it's easy to forget when you get it on a, on a, a homework question or a quiz or a test. All right, covalent is sharing electrons. And so these bonds occur, they get their eight, they, they satisfy the octet rule. They each get their eight electrons around, but it's because they're sharing. So when fluorine shares its electron with another fluorine, the electrons count double. So this fluorine has its own electron and it's borrowing this one. So let me go to the whiteboard a minute. So we have this fluorine and it has seven electrons. And then we're gonna go with a purple fluorine. And it of course has seven, right? So these two fluorine molecules, these are not ions, they have not given up any or taken any additional electrons, they're going to share. So these two electrons are going to circulate in this space between the two molecules, excuse me, the two elements. They're gonna go in between this nucleus with this positive charge and around to this nucleus with this positive charge. So the electrons are going to fill the space. Then they're constantly moving. The same, remember, it acts like a wave as much as a particle. So both electrons are filling the space equally. Therefore, both of them count for each element. So this fluorine now has, with this covalent bond, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if we, if we redraw this with a Lewis dot structure, you draw them next to each other and you draw those shared electrons in between them. This is how we draw the Lewis dot structure of a molecule. They are sharing their unpaired electrons. So this fluorine has eight now. It has seven of its own, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The other electron counts completely for that. It also counts completely for the other. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So when you have the, the, the sharing here is, is complete between the two and it, each electron counts completely for both. So that's how they satisfy the octet rule by sharing. Because you can, you can look at it over here and over here. You can say these two electrons belong to this fluorine and these two electrons belong to that fluorine. So any covalent molecule satisfies the octet rule and the octet rule is getting eight paired electrons in its valence shell or its, its shell by sharing. The other way we draw this is we take this shared area and we just draw a line. It's a quicker way 
you still draw these because these are called unshared pairs. These are pairs of electrons that are not being shared. These, these electrons belong completely to this fluorine. These electrons belong completely to this fluorine. These electrons are shared. So we draw a line. It just makes it a lot easier because when we get into what's called a double and a triple bond, which means you can have more than two electrons being shared, you draw lines for each and it's just, it's a quicker way. So when you see the line, that's a bond. That's a pair of electrons being shared between the two elements. Okay, I'm just checking slides. So let's go back over to the slides a minute. Okay, so you see each of these, these are all halogens. These are all in group seven. So they all have seven electrons, which means three pairs of unshared, they're already paired. And then each one has a single one. So all of these, and you notice how they get bigger and bigger, are creating covalent bond by sharing that electron. And there's how we draw with the line. If it's Lewis, you must include all electrons. So you include all of the valence, but the shared ones are easier to draw it as a line. Remember what the octet rule is. They're trying to achieve the noble gas electron configuration. And it's just a definition. Um, um, remember too for, you know, hydrogen gas, hydrogen plus hydrogen, that first orbit only has two electrons. So hydrogen and hydrogen share two, that's a complete filled shell for the inner smallest shell closest to the, nu the uh, nucleus. That's period one. So period one has a duet, but we, we talk about the, all the rest, which is the octet, eight. Okay, and this is just reinforcing that each element, each atom has full, the shared electron counts fully for that atom to get to get to the eight. So we draw the Lewis structure based on a formula we follow to figure out how many bonds there are, how many shared electrons. And we have to, at the end of the Lewis structure, at the end of drawing it, we have to go back and count and make sure we have accounted for all of the electrons that exist. How do we know how many electrons there are? Because you look at the periodic table and you say, how many valence electrons does each of these elements have? Carbon has four, right? It's in group four. Hydrogen has two. Well, hydrogen has one, two hydrogens have two, right here. Chlorine has seven, two chlorines are 14. So we would have 14, 16, 20. 20 electrons that we now need to represent in our Lewis structure. And you'll, you will learn to do that very well. Now, Lewis structures are not, do not depict the shape. We draw them as just flat. Vesper is what will depict the shape when we get to that, that lecture later. Um, but you have to start with the Lewis structure to be able to determine the shape. Notice here, the Lewis structure is drawn with the dots. Here is the line you do, well, okay. Sometimes you will see a line across or straight up for the, for the lone pair, the unshared pair. I don't do that because I find it confusing, but you will see it, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, so instead of the dots, you'll see either a line straight up or sometimes even a line across, although that's not that common. That's how you'll see me do it, but they're all acceptable as long as you make it very clear what you're drawing. It's important when you draw Lewis structures to be as neat as you can because you're using this to keep track of where your electrons are and for obvious reasons, you want to be able to read it. 
So with the Lewis chart, it doesn't really matter. These are all hydrogens. But, you know, let's say one of these had been a chlorine. It doesn't matter what you put where, as long as they're all connected to the correct center atom and you're showing the unshared electrons. All of your electrons are accounted for. Okay. So how do we figure out how to draw a Lewis structure? First, you count all the valence electrons. So up here, I said carbon has four, each hydrogen has one, so that's two, each chlorine has seven, so that's 14. Add them all up, I have 20. So the first thing is you just use the periodic table and the group number, and you calculate your total number of electrons that have to be distributed. Then you choose your central atom. It's the least electronegative. So go back to my definition of electronegativity. The least electronegative is going to be in the middle because it's got, it's got to do the most sharing, right? We're talking about sharing electrons and a more electronegative atom is not gonna be as likely to share. So the one that's most likely to share, which is the least electronegative, is going to be in the center. Hydrogen is never in the center, ever. Hydrogen can make one bond and that's it. Fluorine, I can't think of an example where you can ever find fluorine in the center. And you sometimes can find chlorine and bromine and particularly iodine in the center. But for this class, we're not gonna put chlorine in the middle. Fluorine will always be on the outside. Chem one, you're going to see the exceptions, but you're also gonna learn why. So. The halogens generally, you know, they have seven electrons. They can make, they can make um, one sharing with their leftover electron. Generally, that's what you're going to be getting is give me chlorine as on the outside. Do not give me chlorine as in the center for this class. So choose your central atom. Most of the time, that's really obvious. Okay, place the other atoms around. You're going to make bonds and now start distributing your electrons. So you draw bonds between the atoms. That, that's, your, that's your shared electrons. And then your valence go around. What are the valence that go around? You go back to this bonding pattern. Everything that, if you write the element and you write the valence electrons around, everything that's already a pair gets recorded as a pair. So if you have a bond with oxygen, you're going to put two unshared pairs around it. And then what happens with the others depends on what, what oxygen is bond, bonded with and that particular molecule. So you place your valence electrons, you place your lines or your dots for your bond, you place your valence, now you go back and count. Make sure you accounted for all of your electrons. It's very, very important that you account for all of your electrons. If you are st still short, you need to create a multiple bond. I'm going to get into that here in a little bit. All right, so this is, as you can see, this bonding pattern, these common bonding patterns often are going to give you your first layout of the molecules, the atoms in your molecule, how they're going to lay out by, by this bonding pattern. Carbon will generally be in the middle with four bonds. Nitrogen is usually has three bonds. So these are the most common. You're only going to give me fluorine and chlorine with one bond. So it's going to be on the sticking on the outside. All right. There is something called the, the Mortimer method. Mortimer is my textbook that I showed you earlier that I absolutely adore. This is the method used in Mortimer and I'll, I'll come back and visit it when we get to the double bonds. But basically what you're doing is you're looking at, you calculate the num total number of bonds that have to be shared based on the assumption, well, what if they all brought all of their bonds with them which is eight for each atom, two for, for hydrogen and helium, which helium is not going to be in any of our molecules. So you take your ideal situation where they each came to the party with their own electrons, right? Fully, full pack with luggage. 
you add up how many you actually have, you subtract the, the two sums, the difference is how many electrons will need to be shared to make that ideal situation. From that, you can actually figure out how many bonds you have. So I'm going to work through this with a later example, but this gives you, I like this because I know from the beginning how many bonds I have. So if I have a double bond or a triple bond, I know right away and it's, I like to know when I'm first putting my molecule together that there are going to be multiple bonds. Okay. I'll work through that with this just as an example, but um, first I'm going to do PCL3 the normal way. So we're going to go to the whiteboard. If I can get my mouse to cooperate. All right. Okay. So PCL3, what is that? That's phosphorus trichloride. It's covalent, nonmetal, nonmetal. So our least electronegative is our phosphorus. If you look on the periodic table, phosphorus here, chlorine is here. Electronegativity increases as you go to the right. So this is less electronegative will go in the middle. And it also just makes sense because we're not gonna put, first of all, you're not gonna put chlorine in the middle of any of the molecules you get in intro. So that also makes it easy. So the first thing you do is you count the number of valence electrons. Okay, phosphorus. Phosphorus is in group 5A, so it has five. Chlorine is in group 7A and it has seven, but I have three of them. So I have a total of 26 electrons that I have to distribute. Okay, that was the first step. Second step, place, so I'm afraid I have to erase my number, but we know we have 26 electrons. I'll write it up here. Okay, because I need the room. All right. Put your phosphorus in the middle. Put your chlorines around. It does not matter how you do it. In the Lewis structure, that doesn't matter. Okay, you can use dots or you can use lines. I'm going to use lines. Each line is two electrons, always. If I have multiple bonds, I'm going to draw another line. So that's two. Chlorine has, remember, go back to that bonding pattern. And all of your halogens, so you have to put your valence electrons in. If you don't, it's not correct. The other thing to remember when doing Lewis structures is you have got to satisfy the octet rule, which means every element has to have eight electrons. Now we have a few exceptions, which I'll go into later and you're just going to memorize. There's three, I think. Um, so right off the bat, I can tell you phosphorus has a problem. It only has three bonds. It only has two, four, six electrons. It needs eight. So put the eight there. There's nothing else for it to bond with, so put an unshared pair. All right, now let's count. We have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, eight, 22, 24, 26. I have 26 electrons, I'm good to go. That's it, there's my Lewis structure, I'm done. Now I want to show you the Mortimer method. This is a nice, simple example. and you can choose to use it or not. That is completely up to you. It's just, I find it very useful and it's nice to have options. So we have the number of valence electrons, but the other thing you do in, <coughs> excuse me, in Mortimer, and I call it the Mortimer method because that's the textbook I got it from, is you calculate the ideal number of 
electrons. Everything already has a full shell, which is eight times the number of atoms we have. If I had a hydrogen in there, I would have to multiply that one times two away. So I've calculated my valence electrons that I actually have, and that's 26. The third is you figure out how many electrons you have to share to get to the ideal. So you're going to say step one minus step two. Ideal minus actual. So that's 32 minus 26. So that's six electrons that have to be shared to get everybody to have a full shell. You can divide step three You're going to divide this number by two. In this case, it's six electrons because there are two electrons in every bond. We're looking for the number of bonds we have. So that gives you three bonds because I have to share six electrons. There are two electrons in each, so I have three bonds. Now I know right away when I go to draw this this structure, I have three bonds. And, you know, phosphorus, chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. Put my dots around. It's the same structure. And this is a simple version, so it's mostly for illustration. But when we get into the multiple bonds, if you have a double bond or a triple bond, this comes in really handy. Or if you're just not sure. So this is... and we'll have more opportunities to work these out. So, you know, it looks weird. If you do, the best way is do it a couple times and then it should click. And if not, then, you know, you might be, you might prefer to use the other method. It's fine. Um, okay. So another, the next slide example is, Carbon. Well, it doesn't really actually have it. I think it's like a methylamine. So I'll go to that slide just so you can look at it and then we'll go back to the whiteboard. So here is the one. This is this is working through the PCL3 with the Mortimer method, right? You have the ideal number of electrons, the actual. So here are the steps. And this is working it through the other way step by step. Okay. That's everything I just did. So here's the next example given in the, in the slides. All right, it's called the CH5N. There are a couple different ways you can write formulas. Um, this is the general indicating how many, just total hydrogens. So I'll rewrite mine like that. So we actually have two atoms in the center now. We have a multi-centered atom. These hydrogens are going to go around both. So both carbon and nitrogen are in the middle. So that's very, very common. You'll get that a lot. And, you know, it's not difficult. You just make sure they bond to each other. 
and then you have to figure out where the hard where the hydrogens go. So back to the whiteboard. So the first step is what are the number of valence electrons? Carbon has four. Nitrogen has one, but you have five of them. And nitrogen has five. So we have four plus five times one for the hydrogen plus five. Of course, that's five, so that's 14. Now, if I want to use Mortimer, I'm going to say, all right, I have 14 actual. What's my ideal? Hydrogen is going to be multiplied by two because that's its full shell state. And then I have two other elements that gets multiplied times eight because that's its filled shell. Remember, ideal is it brings all of its electrons to the party. So that's 26. All right, so I have 26 total electrons if everybody brought their own. I subtract what I actually have, right? And I get 12 that have to be shared. This is the Mortimer method. I divide that number by two because there are two electrons in every bond and I end up with six bonds. So my molecule will have six bonds. So that's why I use the Mortimer method. All right. So let's write up here. We have 14 valence electrons we have to count for. And we're gonna have six bonds. So the first thing you do is put your atoms next to each other, your carbon and your nitrogen, because they have to be next to each other. And I already, so how do we place the hydrogens? Well, you, I'll give you a little hint. Carbon is always going to have four bonds of some kind. It might be a double bond. You can have a double bond. However, I have five hydrogens and I have a bond here. So there's my six. Five are with the hydrogens and one's with the carbon. So I should have this because carbon has four bonds. Can carbon be a, have an unshared pair? It can, but not in this class. We're not going to get that. Which leaves, there's three of my hydrogens. That leaves two more. Okay, now if I do that, nitrogen does not have eight yet. I have not filled the octet rule for nitrogen, so I have to put an unshared pair. All right, let's count. So I have six bonds. Let's count the electrons. There's two on the nitrogen, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. I do have 14 electrons there. I have accounted for everything. Both of my elements, my main elements have eight. So I've satisfied the octet rule. And so there's my structure. What if I had tried to put the hydrogens around nitrogen? You would not have, it wouldn't have worked because you don't have a full shell. We're not going to do that in this class. You're not, don't give me that. Carbon wants bonds. Always give me a bond on carbon. That's just the simplest way to, to give that one. And remember, I want you to look at one other thing. The bonding pattern. Go back and look at that slide. The common bonding pattern for carbon, when we put the dots around it, is that. And for nitrogen, there's its dot structure. And sure enough, whoops. That's the bonding. There's the dot structure for carbon. And sure enough, it has four bonds. And nitrogen has three. So this is, we put these together and we got that. So those common 
bonding structures, this, this helps you with that as a starting point. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So remember that about carbon, it wants four bonds. You put your hydrogens will always go on the outside, always. You're going to give carbon four bonds. That is going to take care of most of your situations. Okay, so here's another example. CH3, by the way, is called a methyl group. We don't call it carbon hydrogen or carbon trihydride. It's called a methyl group. It's just one of the, uh, the chemistry names. If you go into organic, you'll learn that. So um, you're not going to be given any questions where you have to name it. That's an organic thing. But just be aware of it. So, you know, CH3 is called a methyl group. Just so you know. Okay. So the question was CH3CL. All right, this actually is really easy. Carbon has four electrons. That pen's not going to work. It's too fat. Hydrogen has one, but you have three of them, and chlorine has seven. So that's a one times three. So three plus four, seven plus seven is 14 valence electrons. Now, one of your questions might be, well, do I have two centers? No, because chlorine is a halogen. It goes on the outside. You have one center, and that's carbon. What's my dot part pattern for carbon. It's that. So let's make those bonds. It does not matter where the hydrogens go and where the chlorines go. Because in a Lewis, it's not giving you shape. It's just giving you what's con connectivity. So this octet rule is filled. Hydrogen, of course, is because it's two and it's represented by the one bond, but the chlorine only right now has two electrons. You have to put the valence electrons, the unshared pairs, around chlorine. It doesn't share those, but we're, Lewis structure shows you where all of the valence electrons are. Now we count the electrons. So I have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. I have 14 electrons, there's my structure. So that's an easy one. The most common mistake is forgetting to put the dots around chlorine, which would make it wrong. All right, what other? Go back to the slides. Right. All right. I am going to stop here. I'll do a short piece on the multiple bonds for the next lecture. It won't be very long, but I'll be able to take the time to work through a few examples and show you how that Mortimer rule really works. So this is the end. So this is the end of part one of lecture seven of Lewis structures. And there will be a part two minutes, probably all we'll do for this. Lewis.